Thank you, Mario. Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to, to be uh, here today. Although this is uh, the place I wanted to be uh, in, um, unfortunately, uh, things uh, uh, went differently and we were uh, unable to reach Paris. But I think uh, uh, we will uh, soon hopefully have the opportunity to travel again and meet and uh, and uh, be together to discuss. And, and for me, I always promote uh, interaction. So it is really difficult uh, to think about how we can communicate while uh, being at distance in many different places. Uh, but during the last uh, uh, few weeks, I was teaching, in fact, uh, two classes. Uh, so I, I was teaching every day this quarter and I discovered that uh, uh, after a little while, we are able to, to actually uh, find ourselves in that place uh, by communicating and interacting. Well, it is much easier when the class is uh, about uh, 30, 40 students, but when it comes to be a large class, it is, uh, of course, uh, much harder. So uh, today I, I thought I will uh, uh, discuss uh, one of the main challenges I believe in robotics, which is uh, how we do interact with the physical world. And uh, this uh, image illustrates a little bit this uh, idea that human eventually uh, will need to bring uh, some aspect of the task, some cognitive aspect maybe, and uh, the robot needs to have enough autonomy to perform the task. And uh, still the human would like to feel the interaction, and that means uh, now uh, we have a rich uh, feedback because we have a happy device that will the complex so in the same thing. Uh, the, actually, the, the, the art is able to feel the brush and the position that is remarkable. Uh, the robot mobile platforms uh, performing different tasks so uh, the task here is uh, all of us know the challenge of manipulation and interaction with the physical world and uh, despite uh, uh, much progress that we have seen in uh, mobility, uh, the problem of uh, going beyond mobility in English has been a challenge. And the uh, reason is uh, there are uh, many different modalities when we are interacting with the physical world. And uh, it is not just uh, a matter of communication, it's a matter of understanding uh, uh, the and dealing with many aspects of those problems. So I feel we, we kept uh, the modality of going to uh, programming our robots in the most simple way that uh, manufacturing has done. So we can say manufacturing of autonomous robots, actually they are completely autonomous, they are repeating the same task over and over. And doing that because of the structure they have. Well, the point is we cannot do that anymore in unstructured environment, and we know that. But somehow we continue to use the same methodology. I mean, we, we think about the robot in a way like a programmable machine that we are going to program. 
And I don't see why today we are still uh, asking people to go to dangerous locations like a hot cable, uh, uh, to, to go to the desert to clean uh, solar panels, uh, to have to dive uh, in, in places that are deep and dangerous, uh, to perform repeated tasks in environments that are very difficult. And all of this requires real physical interaction. I mean, can we remove a human from rigs? Can we remove a human from doing tasks in the middle of nowhere uh, to repair, to fix, and uh, to uh, even uh, bring uh, um, natural material like in mining? Uh, th this is unbelievable, the amount of uh, danger and uh, uh, pollution that is brought to the environment uh, because we are building uh, all kind of structure uh, to make it safe for the human to cool the environment but at the same time to to cause all all kind of damage well the same thing in in construction the the same thing in many aspects of all the applications i really like this example i mean all of us we know this robot and it's amazing robot and machine but when it comes to performing a physical task Okay, can sorry, sorry, me... Osama. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, can you please uh, turn off your video because when there are videos on the screen, uh, your audio is uh, very bad. Uh, so maybe it's, uh, it's a problem with. Oh, the, uh, I have only videos. <laughs> no, no. I mean your yeah. personal video. Let's say that maybe the situation would be better. Uh, well, I I can't change the the. Um, uh, let me see. I can try to change the. Uh, you said it's the sound that is not good? Yeah, I mean, especially when the videos are on, uh, the sound is okay. uh, not very good. Can, can you hear me now better? Yeah. Okay, so it is, uh, I, I changed the, 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 the microphone. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, if we are doing a task, what is, what is uh, uh, the generality of this task? I mean, when we see this, we are impressed, but how much programming went into building this task and how general is, is uh, this uh, performance is the robot able to perform this in different situation or uh, if we just change the location so this is something that a human managed to do and managed to do very well and uh, we managed to do because we uh, essentially develop skills developing skills and human skills are uh, completely different. I, we, we, we never build skills by relying on precision and accuracy. We, we build our skills by feeling our way and touching and interacting with the objects. So this modality of interacting and touching objects is very different from the modality we program robot today. And this is a, a modality that brings not the precision that we have with our uh, industrial robot, where we require robot to be stiff and rigid uh, to deliver that uh, precision. Uh, today, we are talking about going to unstructured environment. And what we need is compliant robots. We need robots that can also feel the way and we need robots that can acquire those skills. So here is uh, the example, uh, I mean, the simplest example of putting uh, two objects face to face. There is no trajectory. Uh, the contact forces are producing reaction forces that guide the robot motion to the goal. So this is something that can be uh, done in many different tasks, but we need to understand many aspects of where this compliant frame, what is going on in terms of the development. And I have uh, just a, a very short video about the development of compliance, because I really think it is quite uh, interesting to see, even with the Puma, with the little compliance we can achieve with it, we were able to do amazing tasks, cooperating between multiple robots, guiding robots, uh, performing cooperation between multiple robots together with compliance. And those concepts were taken to humanoid robots uh, that were equipped with uh, additional sensors 
of light to human motion. And uh, all of this uh, development resulted in a behavior that couldn't be actually implemented anywhere without uh, dealing with the problem in a different way. So compliance, uh, I believe, is key and is going to be key to the interaction. We need compliance capabilities so that we can develop those skills. And when we think about compliance, it's uh, basically force feedback on the contact, but also we need compliance on the full robot. And that means we are going to need uh, compliance on the different links and we need to have torque sensing. So one of the things we did uh, with, the, with the Puma uh, early on was to take the Puma that has all that friction and retrofit it with a torque sensor, which wasn't, uh, uh, I mean, sufficient for one degree of freedom of the Puma. So we decided then to go and build a whole robot with torque control so we can achieve compliance. This is one of the performance of that uh, prototype of the robot that shows the level of uh, uh, compliance you can achieve if you have a pure and uh, high performance torque control. Now, with, this, with, with that uh, ability, we can go and build robots. And in fact, that was done uh, at DLR, DLR built the LWR, as you know, and then the Puka, and then we get the Franca, and now there are a number of new uh, technologies allowing us finally to have the hardware, the hardware that enables interaction, manipulation, cooperation, performance, and safety. So we have the new robots. Great. And I'm so happy that now we have finally commercial product. However, we still have our old habits. And the, the, the habits we have are to miss, I mean, to not use these robots at all their cap cap capabilities. These robots have torque sensing and uh, they have the ability to create compliant motion, but we still program these robots as if they were uh, uh, the old robot, that is we program them at the lowest level of programming a robot, which is to create trajectories for the joints. I call it programming them at assembly language level. And the problem with that is we go and pre-program the robot and we end up with a situation where we make just small adjustment uh, on the trajectory. And that is completely different uh, when we are in an as unstructured environment, because in unstructured environment, we need to re recreate that trajectory all the time to, ad to accommodate all the errors and the uh, problems that we have with the robot. So are we going to continue to program robot trajectories? I mean, even if we program robot trajectories, we haven't solved the contact problem. The contact problem requires much more than just going and finding a trajectory. So the only way we can address this is by creating more abstractions, building more capabilities in the control, using really the robot, using the robot with, it, with its sensors and its tactile capabilities to build skills. So, I mean, like with computer languages, we can abstract and move up in the, in the capability of the robot so we can connect all these capabilities to planning and planning with uh, reliable skills, build autonomy on the robot execution and increase autonomy in its capabilities. Human skills are amazing and understanding them might enable uh, coming up with uh, manipulation strategies for the robot. The problem is, again, we, we go and try to understand the human skills and learn them from human, but we end up again with trajectories. Well, what I would like to, to see is that we are really thinking about the problem, about the physical interaction. Thinking about, actually, from all that data, we can extract something 
critical to generalizing the approach of making contact with the environment. The compliant frames that can be extracted from the data can enable building those skills. Understanding the material and sending the geometry can lead us to take the data, segment that data, map it over all the primitives that we encounter, and encode it in strategies to perform those tasks, not trajectories. So then we are able to generalize. That is, we want the policies. What are those strategies that and in you have some examples. So, okay. Uh, here we have an example. Uh, this is a piece we are placing on the uh, miniature of the 787 wing. And you, dip, you, 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 you move it away wherever, and the robot will find its way back. It is executing a strategy not relied on, on uh, just a uh, a locked trajectory for the robot. Now we can go and build those strategies and the discussion there is quite complex because we need to think about the hierarchy in terms of building basic primitives and going to behaviors and then building those strategies. But with those strategies we can reach a generalization and we can build uh, all kind of skills that can be reused and that can be shared and that can create a different way of programming robots and maybe enable us finally to bring human and machine uh, to work fully together. Another aspect of this is how we can understand the interaction with human. There are many aspects to, to this problem in terms of the, uh, uh, the intention of the robot, the intention of the human, the communication, but a, a very important aspect also uh, uh, it deals with modeling the musculoskeletal system so that we can uh, estimate uh, the stiffnesses and compliances and the characteristics of the human with whom we are performing uh, that collaboration. And there has been a lot of wonderful work that really uh, brought a lot of benefit to those uh, modeling from robotics. So robotic models have been helpful in bringing metrics and different aspects uh, that are allowing us to make advances in human motion understanding. And uh, especially with modeling more and more precisely the upper body. Uh, the lower body has been uh, really uh, progressing uh, much with, uh, in biomechanics, but the upper body, the, the shoulder complex, and all these parts were really, really difficult to build. The other thing about uh, the, this problem is we very often engineer a solution and uh, if we think about robotics and all the different areas of robotics from health, wellness, uh, to service, to industry, to field robotics, what is common about all of these is the connection between perception and action and it's not a, a one-loop connection. It is a, a connection that requires multiple uh, layers of control and planning and strategies and all of these things that actually build the core research that we do in robotics. Research that brings sensing, that brings design material. Robotics is amazingly multidisciplinary. And very often not being able to really have that uh, general view about all the sub areas of robotics makes it difficult because we go with our own view to the problem and uh, without really accounting for all the potential that can come from considering all the aspects of robotics. And this is something that uh, even brings all the uh, societal aspect uh, uh, of uh, using the robot and deploying the robot. But this is another important point uh, as we move and build uh, robots uh, that are going to deal with the human and the interaction with human. So when we think about conventional robots and from the beginning of what I know about robotics was the idea we, we plan and execute. Now we plan differently by learning trajectories and then execute by interpolating between those trajectories. 
Well, this is not really helping because we are creating this gap and uh, we are not able to replan in real time. One of the things about interacting with the physical world in unstructured environment is the fact that uh, we are still far from full autonomy. However, if we really realize that these connections are going to be built over multi-layered system that take into account all the frequency requirement, the hardware, the mechanism, the interaction requires to be done at very high rate. However, the input of it, if it is a skill, it will be much slower. And little by little, in fact, if you look at the system, we are building a functional autonomy. Functional autonomy doesn't mean that we are solved the whole problem of cognitive autonomy that will come from the human through an interface that connect the human to the, the robot and its environment uh, through this functional autonomy. And that means we are going to allow the human uh, to help the robot because this is what the robot is going to need through speech, through physical contact and interaction, through haptics or uh, through even programming. This is an example of the autonomy you can build. Vision doesn't help us take a glass because it is not really visible in the, in the clouds and you need to touch it and feel it. And then uh, this is actually a, a visiting a student from uh, Italy who has worked on this and he is showing that you don't break it but you, you still have it in the hand. Those ideas, of bringing uh, different capabilities can be built finally in an integrated uh, set of things that we can build to become the whole body controller that I'm talking about in that architecture. If we think about all the problems that we need to deal with, like the posture control while co controlling the task, as we control the contact, as we deal with the constraints, as we deal with the balance, the, these for a, a robot with many degrees of freedom. Well, the planning or the learning, whatever we do, it's going to be huge, huge problem. And if we want this robot to interact in real time, it's going to be much, much harder. However, if we look at how human manage, human focus on the task, we move our hand to reach, our shoulders start to reach, uh, start to move, to accommodate the fact that the, the hand is extended. The posture is working to assist and help the task. Human use separate controllers for all these different things that work together. And this is actually the constraints consistent whole body control algorithm we developed. It takes a description and build just one representation of everything. And this representation is done in this mathematical way where we have a posture in the system that is consistent with the motion that we are asking the robot to perform, in consistent with the contact and consistent with the stability and balance of the robot. And with this representation, we span all the space of the robot and now we can allow our robot to interact in real time with full autonomy, only functional autonomy. So here is an example how this is going to, to, to work because now we are making multiple contact. There will be internal forces that we need to model. We have a model of the robot. We have a controller that makes use of that model. And now we can apply the control to the robot. And in this example, you can see a robot performing multiple contact on surfaces that are slippery surfaces, maintaining uh, all the reaction forces in the cone of friction in order to achieve stability. Uh, this concept actually we couldn't implement it until uh, we managed to find a robot with torque control because it relies on torque control. Where can we find torque control? Well, you have to go to DLR and we, we, we went there. In fact, uh, uh, Mikael here is uh, implementing uh, this on the uh, uh, um, Toro robot and uh, uh, the performance and uh, the capability that uh, was 
he was able to achieve were remarkable, uh, bringing uh, that level first layer of whole body control uh, to experimental verification. We should not forget there is another look, the human contact with the environment, uh, I mean, contact with the robot, contact through a haptic interaction to achieve this task. And that other loop brings the human through the interface to intervene at any of those layers in the control. So we can contact with the robot to guide the robot. So this is physical contact, or we can be in contact with the robot, any part of the robot safely interacting compliantly, or we are haptically interacting with the robot where we are guiding the robot, teaching the robot in fact, and the robot is learning a task from the human. This is an example where uh, we are teaching the robot the task of uh, taking out a cable from a high tension. So this should be up and the human could be sitting in a, a station wagon uh, away from the dangerous location uh, achieving this task. So this is actually what we did uh, for Ocean One. And Ocean One was a, a, a robot that was interacting with, with uh, divers, but also was able to go and reach areas deep in the water. One of the things I uh, would like to mention is that Ocean One, which was built to dive for 200 meters now, is redesigned, and it's redesigned to go to 1,000 meters. The new robot looks like this. Uh, and uh, uh, we were supposed to go to, in April, we were supposed to be in France diving with the robot. Unfortunately, uh, things didn't go the way we hoped. And uh, the robot now is uh, almost, almost finished in terms of its assembly, getting ready to uh, that uh, expedition uh, that hopefully will happen sometimes, maybe in the fall or later in 2021. Now, one thing about Ocean One, it is much more than just like the robot. It is all the control architecture that I talked about in terms of how we describe the dynamics at the task, at the hand, guide the robot to interact with object. But when we interact with the object, we modify the dynamics because you create a different dynamics when you have an object. We call it the augmented object dynamics that takes a, the combination of all the different dynamics presented, projected there. Another characteristic is the idea that if we are ducking, if we are making contact, we better know how to use the redundancy in the robot in a way to minimize the impact. You can see how the heavy robot is still moving, but the arms are bending. And what, when the arms are bending, they are taking the inertia of the robot and allowing the robot to uh, duck without creating large impact forces. We have to pay attention to the posture when we approach an object. And we have to make sure that we are not in the area where we have large effective inertias. In here, you can see the effective inertia when the arm is extended. You feel the whole body. In here, you just feel the arms. It is much smaller inertia. And in impact and contact and interactions, you better be in this configuration. So uh, since I have uh, two minutes, I'm going just quickly to, to, to show you, uh, to those of you who haven't seen it, I'm sure most of you have seen the robot assembly, how we tested the robot uh, in the pool, because we couldn't test the robot in the air. And we had to take the robot to the pool every time uh, to test it and discover there were problems, go back and forth. So now we are building an aquarium at Stanford for the robot, and hopefully we will be able to, to do the testing inside. We took the robot to La Lune, which is the vessel uh, that sunk off the coast of France, and uh, uh, the robot uh, went there and got stuck actually, and we rescued the robot. We, we recover this vase, the Catalan vase, uh, that uh, was not touched by human since 1664. And I'm going to end up with, the, uh, again, the video of uh, uh, Ocean One Expedition. Uh, the robot went to uh, Santorini and did a, another expedition on, uh, on the volcano uh, 
of uh, uh, the Colombo volcano. Uh, but uh, I, I, I will just uh, show you uh, these uh, uh, sequences of uh, uh, the diving of the robot. Uh, the robot is uh, interacting with the human through the haptic device. These are uh, seven degree of freedom devices that are actually today uh, in the space station controlling robot uh, down here on the planet Earth. And uh, the same haptic devices are used here uh, uh, operating the robot. Uh, and uh, uh, at 15 meters, we were just testing the robot to make sure that everything was working. And believe me, we were really worried that the robot will uh, explode and uh, it will be a catastrophic thing. Thanks, Serena. Uh, so uh, Olivia, the diver, was telling the robot, you're ready to go for the big dive. And here the robot is moving uh, now down to 91 meters. This is the control room. And uh, from there, you can see how dark the environment is difficult. Uh, to see anything, so we placed light and cameras to film uh, the action. And you can see the robot coming from the top. One thing you forget about uh, uh, operating in the water is that you have sediment, and when you come very close to the sediment, all the sediment will come and remove all your vision. And you are navigating with the robot, so the robot here you can see it's. Uh, even hitting one of the cannon, these are two cannon, and the robot gets stuck between the two cannon. And essentially, uh, any maneuver of pulling didn't work because the robot was completely stuck. But this robot has arms, and with the haptic device, you can push yourself to free yourself from uh, that uh, position using the arms of the robot. And uh, this was uh, the way we rescued the robot, and uh, the robot. Uh, came back that night at midnight, and we were able to go back uh, uh, again uh, to recover uh, the vase that you saw. So here the robot is locating the vase, and uh, now the operation is to take the vase in the hands of the robot. And these are very slippery uh, objects. You, you put your hand, you close it, you pull it, I remember almost eight times before getting it uh, properly and secure with the other hand. And finally, now uh, the last task is to place it in the container. And what is nice is you close the container and uh, the container comes on its own. So once you close the container, that's it, you succeeded. So, so he's asking me to close the container. Landing on the moon. <laughs> so anyway, that was that was really exciting, and uh, the mission was in fact uh, uh, secret until we uh, completed it, and then we had a press conference later in uh, uh, two weeks later. Uh, it was a big celebration here with champagne for everyone, including the robot. So th that, that mission was not really about just uh, the modality of interacting with the robot, but it was an illustration of all the uh, importance of connecting the human uh, with the machine in ways where uh, the two are working in sy sy synergetically uh, uh, enough autonomy on the side of the robot uh, uh, and intervention of the human uh, to support that task. And uh, this robot now is uh, being rebuilt to go deeper and have uh, more opportunities for exploration. Uh, these were the students uh, who worked on this. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of the divers that assisted us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Khadib. Um, we have, oh, I see, see. all right, 
So I thank you again for staying uh, late uh, in the night with us. And um, very nice talk. We, we got some questions I'd like to post to you. Um, for example, uh, Sarah is, is saying, in terms of human safety when cooperating with robots, how it is met when executing a task? Yes, uh, thank you for this question, Sarah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, safety uh, of robots is uh, completely, uh, I mean, uh, one of the most important part that would enable robots to interact physically with a human is safety. And safety uh, uh, is coming from compliance because compliance is allowing us to make lighter robot. And this is the fact that uh, with torque control, you are removing uh, the reflected inertia of the rotors of the motors, and that enables designing robots that are much lighter. But in addition, uh, there are a lot of other aspects of uh, 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 safety that comes in the software, that comes in the sensors that we are using. Uh, there is a whole study of safety that uh, we did to create uh, actuators and mechanisms that are intrinsically safe by uh, using uh, hybrid actuation, muscle-like actuations augmented with a small motor. And I encourage you to take a look at uh, that work. Uh, they, they provide both safety and performance uh, and guaranteed safety in that whatever happened to the software, the computer, you're still safe. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't know if we have time for another questions. Sorry, we are already late. So um, I would like to thank you again for the for the talk, and uh, I think we can uh, move to the next to the speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and uh, uh, a good day to everyone. And uh, it was thanks. really a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night.